Good evening, and welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio while we're on Saga 960. So I wanted to address some rumors that have been out there in regards to my potentially running in the upcoming provincial election for the none of the above party in Mississauga Lakeshore. It is something that I'm seriously considering, and I've uh, gone out and uh, and got some people to nominate me, and uh, I'm thinking about uh, registering uh, for for the for the party for this upcoming election. And I want to tell you um, why. Um, first of all, a lot of people have said, why would you run for the none of the above party? Uh, it's not a mainline party and you haven't got any chance of winning. I think that's actually part of the problem uh, in our democracy is that, uh, that uh, people don't vote for qualified local candidates. They just vote the brand name or the leader. Um, and, uh, and, and in the United States, as an example, when you elect Congress, Senate, uh, governor, uh, state representative, et cetera, separately from the president, people think through who their local representatives are. And those local representatives, those local senators can end up having a, you know, a very independent following and support level uh, than the president uh, or the leader of whatever the, the different parties are. Um, and they can, I think, do a far better job representing the people and arguing their points in, uh, in Congress. Uh, and so it's frustrating to me that uh, that my friends and some people would say, if you're not running for the liberals or the conservatives, um, you don't have a chance of, of winning. Um, and they may be true, but uh, I think that's wrong. And I want to make an argument that uh, people uh, should be uh, looking at the qualifications and the issues that uh, are supported by local candidates and voting for those local candidates. I also think that, frankly, in a system where we may have a minority parliament, a minority legislature, um, an independent uh, person uh, with a smaller party might actually have uh, a great deal of influence uh, in the decision making. I think that uh, that uh, that would be a very unique position to have and, uh, and, and, and one that should be thought about. More importantly, I really want the opportunity to argue some of the the things I believe, uh, and I believe very strongly in and and those are the things that are, I think, to a large extent, uh, supported by uh, the none of the above party and the none of the above party was uh, was started by a, a buddy of mine uh, because he felt very frustrated that democracy um, was challenged in Canada and that we needed to do something strongly about it and and the things that he wanted to do is put in place referendum recall and what he calls real accountability uh, and 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 he would say that there's over 50 countries in the world that have either referendum or recall and that referendum and recall work uh, and they work because it's a discipline on the local MPs, MPPs, president, uh, prime ministers, premiers, etc., um, that uh, can occur between election time periods and make sure they're they're doing their job. Uh, and and if you're, you know, following some of the things that happen with referendums in in Switzerland, as an example, they get a whole booklet. Um, of all the different re uh, referendum that uh, people would vote on, and um, and and then they um, and then they uh, they actually have a right to say these are the issues, uh, the ten issues that they want to have referendums on in the future. Uh, referendums, um, I think 70, 75 percent of them that are started by people actually succeed. Uh, the vast majority that are started by special interest groups, even if they succeed, are defeated in the future. Uh, and the best example is Proposition 13 that got a lot of press uh, in uh, California that was supported by a special interest group that uh, wanted to cut back dramatically and uh, on government spending and, and enforce that balanced budget amendment. Um, it was defeated in a subsequent referendum, which said that, you know what, these people had an opportunity to argue their point of view. And then the public said, you know what, we don't actually like it. And, and got rid of it uh, in a subsequent election, which means that the public really had an opportunity to give a lot of thought to a, a specific issue and, uh, and, and uh, get rid of it. And think about the, the referendum on separation of Quebec. Why is it that a really important issue, we say we can't decide in parliament or in the legislature, we actually have to put it to a referendum. That probably suggests that referendum um, are, uh, are the way that you wanna decide things and, and make sure that you've got um, more than 50%. And I would argue on something like uh, separation of a province, you should have a super majority like you would in a corporate situation where you have to have 66% of uh, the people uh, in a referendum support something as as uh, profound as as that. So I really agree with referendum and I think that people are smart. I interviewed on my show someone that uh, made a lot of money in Silicon Valley, came back to Canada, he was a political uh, activist previously, and he wants to create an app that will effectively pull us on a fairly regular basis so that it's a referendum almost every day on uh, different issues. Um, you know, polling is effectively a way of getting people's points of view, but the problem is it doesn't hold the elected representatives to enforce what, uh, what, what the people say. And we always question whether there's enough people in a poll that say it. If we actually had referendums on an annual basis that, that um, 
we had to think about and vote on, I think that uh, it would give our elected representatives, number one, far more guidance on, uh, on what we want and what we don't want, and we would hold it to them. And I think that would be excellent for our democracy. Recall uh, is another issue. And you know, in the United States, you can recall not only governors and legislatures, but judges. Um, and uh, uh, other than the Supreme Court, I guess. And, uh, and think of the power that we would have in that. And we know that there are people in parliament, in the legislature, and maybe even in the judici judiciary that don't deserve their jobs. And it's almost impossible to get rid of them. And if we had a recall right, and you think about the way the recall right works and, and different places have different structures, but you've got to get thousands of signatures and then you've got to run a campaign uh, to do it. So it's difficult to actually exercise it. But you know, if you had a right to actually recall someone between elections, I think that people would be a lot less willing to just go with the flow, follow the leader, uh, do whatever the whip has told them to do, and would be a lot more mindful of what their local residents, uh, their local citizens, their local uh, uh, voters want them to do. Uh, and recall works. Um, you know, the governor of California had a very uh, noteworthy uh, recall that he won. Um, and uh, defeated uh, the opposition in the last election. But, you know, we, it was press worthy. We paid attention to it, uh, um, uh, at least Californians and Americans did. And it was a great way of understanding exactly where people were, were coming. Real accountability, uh, I think, is something that we don't have enough of. Uh, I interviewed a chief economist of a, of a, of a fiscal uh, organization uh, in Ottawa that, uh, that is formerly of the, the, the budget office uh, in Parliament just this past week. And he talked about, well, if uh, the government institutes uh, daycare and pharmacare, we're going to have an unsustainable budget. Well, the government has said they're going to implement uh, childcare, daycare, and, uh, and pharmacare. So effectively, he's not believing the government's going to actually do what they say they're going to do to come up with his conclusion that we actually have a sustainable budget. And I called him on it. And he said, you're right. If they actually implement what they say they're going to implement, we're going to have an unsustainable budget. Debt and deficits are going to rise to a unsustainable degree. Well, you know, if you were around in the 1990s, you know that they were talking about a peso crisis in Canada. And, uh, and Paul Martin, Minister of Finance, and Jean Chrétien had to come in place and cut deficits and debt dramatically, such that by the end of the 90s, we were actually thinking we we're going to be going into surplus for a long period of time in the future. And that's the only way that we saved the Canadian dollar and the Canadian budget uh, at the time. Are we headed that way again? I'm worried. Um, and so we need to have some real accountability. You think about the current Ontario budget. Climate change was named once. This is, other than you know, COVID-19, uh, the pandemic for the last two years, this is probably the defining issue of our generation and how we're going to deal with it. And it's mentioned once in the whole budget document. We need real accountability. Some of the other things that I think people have talked about, uh, but we haven't had enough focus on, and the reason why is because the governments get elected, don't want to pay attention to it because they see it as as controlling them more than they want to be controlled. Um, Justin Trudeau, the current Prime Minister of Canada, supposedly said something like 1,500 times during the 2019 election that this will be the last election under the first past the post. And first past the post, where you know if you only get more than the next guy, one vote more than the next guy, even if there's three, five, 10 people running, you win the election, is a bad way. To, to run a political system. We would never have that in the corporate world. Politicians would never have that and accept that if they were leading a, uh, if they were having a leadership convention, they would always ensure that you had runoff successive uh, ballots and got to 50.1% before they would actually pick a winner. A corporation would allow, I don't think a, a first past the post kind of situation in a major corporate decision. Um, it just, it doesn't make logical sense that that's the way that we elect our representatives such that we end up with a situation where in Canada, the, the Conservatives actually won the popular vote, but had substantially less seats than the Liberals. And so therefore the Liberals got to, uh, to form the government. I don't think that makes sense. I happen to believe that proportional representation makes sense. And I think that one of the big issues in this last uh, couple of months has been that there were 15% supposedly based on polls of Canadians that disagreed with the whole issue of vaccine mandates, vaccine passports, masking, et cetera. And I disagreed with some of what they said and a lot of what they did. Um, I, uh, for one, uh, had argued on the show uh, for vaccine passports or testing. 
that you could show that you were negative. And, and I'm, I'm an example. I, I got COVID-19 and I'm told, don't go out and get the booster for another six months because you've effectively built up these antibody immunities. Well, our passport system that we had didn't allow people that had actually suffered COVID-19 and had the antibodies in their system to, to frankly get exempted from a vaccine obligation. And now the CDC and, and other people are saying, don't get that booster, don't get that extra vaccine because you've got the antibodies anyway and it'll do you no good. So we had a passport system that actually didn't make scientific sense. And, and in, in my own company, what we did is we allowed people that didn't have the vaccine to get tested on a regular basis to prove that they were uh, negative. And we asked people that were positive and or that were coughing uh, or sneezing or, 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 or feverish to go home because they don't have a right to infect other people. But we didn't fire people that, uh, that didn't have a, a vaccination. And you know, frankly, that's what Robin, uh, Roman Barber argued uh, and got kicked out of the Conservative caucus uh, for. Um, he said vaccine passports or uh, negative uh, testing. Um, and it got sort of uh, perceived by the, by the media and by the Conservatives that he was against vaccines completely and against masks completely. And maybe he, he was, but, but his argument was vaccine pass, vaccines um, or a negative test. But 15% of Canadian population um, supposedly, uh, according to polls, disagreed with the, the government situation and they weren't being heard. And, uh, and, and therefore we had the freedom uh, convoy, the trucker uh, uh, convoy, the trucker occupation in Ottawa. And understand, I've got vaccines, I've, I've got vaccinations, I've got uh, the booster. I believe strongly in the benefit of vaccines and I've had people on the show and I've argued very strongly for the benefit of vaccines. I think they've changed healthcare in Canada dramatically for the benefit and around the world. And, and our mortality, mortality rates are uh, today at a low because of vaccinations. And, and so no way in shape or form am I arguing against vaccines. But what I am saying is that if 15% of the people in Canada, four and a half million people have a point of view they deserve to be heard. If we had proportional representation, Max Bernier and his party would have had, they got, I think, six, 7% of the popular vote. They would have had, what, 20 seats in parliament? If it was proportional representation, 15, uh, 6 to 8% of, of 388 seats. Um, the Green Party would have had 4 or 5%. Uh, so they would have had, uh, uh, you know, 15 uh, seats. Um, in, uh, in Parliament. If those people are heard in Parliament, in our legislatures, there's a lot less of their argument that they need, that they're not being heard and they need to go protest. I disagreed with the occupation. I thought it was completely wrong. I have gone out to many different protests and demonstrations. And when I've done that, I've gone out with myself and a sign, maybe. I don't think you have the right to take a megaphone, an amplifier, a big, huge 18-wheel truck, a pickup truck, a bouncy castle, or any of those other things. That's not written into our constitution or our charter of rights that you have the right to take an 18 wheel truck and park it in front of parliament hill or the legislature and honk it until two o'clock in the morning but you do have the right to assemble to free speech and so i will argue to the rest of my days even if i disagree with people i had a person on just two days ago from the ontario party i disagree almost completely with everything that he's saying he's very socially conservative i think borderline uh, white supremacist not him but the leader of his party that's why uh, derek sloan was kicked out of the conservative caucus but I think he has the right to make his argument as long as it's, it's not hate speech. And, uh, and that's what freedom of speech is all about. That's what freedom of assembly is all about. But it doesn't include truck convoys. I think proportional representation is the solution for that because the small voice will get heard in parliament and in the legislature. And first past the post, what it does is it, it, it super um, inflates a, a, a plurality point of view and makes it a majority point of view, which is wrong. It doesn't deserve. And I also think that our, our system where we, 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 we go first past the post in different areas, uh, such that the Liberal Party um, federally ends up getting uh, more seats than the Conservatives um, because they got a whole bunch of uh, votes in Alberta and the Liberals just got enough votes in Ontario, effectively means that our system overvalues a Toronto voter's vote and undervalues an Alberta voter's vote because a Toronto voter's vote has a higher probability of electing a member of parliament than an Alberta voter's vote does. Think about that. That's not democracy. When an Alberta voter can quite justifiably say, my vote is worth 60% or 70% of a Toronto voter's vote because I can elect less people because I'm just all collected together in a couple of ridings in Alberta. 
That's wrong. And frankly, think about it, because the Bloc Québécois is concentrated in Quebec, they get substantially more. They get like 25% of all the, the, the votes in, uh, in Parliament um, because they get like 40% of the votes, 30% of the votes in Quebec, but they only got 12% across Canada. If you had proportional representation, they would get dramatically less votes, less seats in, uh, in the House of Commons. So proportional representation, I think, is the right structure. People then say, well, then you don't have people that represent the different ridings. Um, number one, regrettably, I don't think too often those local representatives represent the ridings. I think we've got leader politics in Canada, and they do whatever the leader says and the whip says, uh, because that's how they get their committee jobs, and that's how they get their trips, and that's how they get uh, promoted to cabinet, and that's how they get uh, nominated, uh, renominated the next time. And so they listen more to the whip and the, and the leader than they do to their local representatives. That said, you can still solve that problem by have something called mixed member proportional, which effectively tries to um, you know, elect people the way that they are elected by region, but then gets more people put into parliament such that in total, you have uh, people uh, in parliament equal to the proportion. And I think that actually has been studied and makes a lot of sense. And these people that are talking about priority voting or preferential voting, uh, where you have successive ballots, um, I think is, uh, is not a way, not a solution, because what it means is that in the end, just the incumbents get elected. And incumbents have way too much power. I was in uh, Dallas, Texas last week and uh, met with a council member from a local city who, uh, after eight years, had to leave because he was uh, subject to term limits. And he said, this is the best thing. Number one, what it does is it brings new blood into, uh, into uh, council and into the legislature. Uh, and it's good enough for the president of the United States. Why isn't it good enough for him on uh, local city council? Secondly, he says what it does is it creates a lot of competition for the different seats because someone that's uh, been on council for eight years and has got trained in that regard starts thinking about state representative. And then after eight years, starts thinking about running for Senate and then for Congress, uh, et cetera. And so it creates a process. And, you know, there are some people that deserve to be in their position for 36 years because they're doing a great job. But the majority of people that are there a long time just have the benefit incumbency and no one can beat them because of name awareness and lack of, uh, of voter attention. So I think there's a whole bunch of different things that we can do to, uh, to improve our democratic system. Uh, the, the, the none of the above party is going to be arguing for that. I'm going to be arguing for that. And I think it's worth consideration. And then I want to talk about some policies because I think policies um, are even more important than, uh, than these electoral ideas that we want to change. I'm going to take a break and come back and talk about some of the policies that I would be supporting in just a couple of minutes. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. As I mentioned earlier, there's been a bunch of rumors about me potentially running for the none of the above party in the upcoming provincial election in the uh, riding of Mississauga Lakeshore. And I wanted to, uh, to talk about that a little bit. Um, because I am considering uh, running. Uh, I've spent the last couple of minutes uh, chatting about uh, direct democracy and what the none of the above party is all about. And, and really what it is about is that um, people are less interested in our democracy today and are less sure that we actually truly have a, a democracy today because of, of a whole bunch of different things. And we can improve that dramatically and ensure that we have uh, a democracy that we're proud of. One of the other issues that, uh, that we've talked about is how difficult it is to get a nomination with a major party and how it ends up being a little club that, uh, that they decide. And, uh, and Greg Vesna, the leader of the, of the Nenegov party, uh, you know, describes what happens in Canada as comparable to Hong Kong. I think that goes too far at times, um, but he's sort of right. Uh, in, the, in the conservative leadership campaign, you may have noticed that the, uh, the organizing committee in their, in their wisdom, I guess, decided that three candidates uh, couldn't run. No one knows why. They just decided they couldn't run. In the United States, in a primary, anyone can run no matter what. Um, in Hong Kong, the organizing party decides who gets to run. Uh, and who gets to run, not only for the governing party, for the, but for the, the, the opposition. Um, I think that we should have open primaries in Canada. We should have open nominations. And, and the fact that there's a couple thousand people that decide who the candidate is for the Liberal Party, the Conservative Party, the NDP Party, or a couple hundred people for the NDP Party and the Green Party, it's wrong. In the United States with open nominations, everyone that is a either declared party member or independent in that area, in that constituency, gets to choose in a primary who the candidate is. And I was just in Dallas, Texas, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and 
in some urban ridings, the Democratic primary is more important than the general election. And in some rural ridings, the Republican primary is more important than the general election. And they were really competitive. They were happening just last week. The signs were up. People were canvassing. Um, everyone was talking about it at lunchtime and at dinner time. People were involved. When you've got a nomination campaign in a, uh, in a riding in Canada, it's almost like you don't want to tell people because you want to keep the club as small as possible so it's easiest to control it. It's wrong. We, we, we talk about how proud we are of our democracy, but it's far, far, far from perfect, and we could improve upon it dramatically. And I could go on uh, about direct democracy and how I think it could be improved, but I won't because I wanted to do two other things. Uh, I, number one, wanted to tell you a little bit about me and why I think I'm qualified to be a, uh, a member of parliament, a, a politician. Um, I graduated from the University of Western Ontario Ivy School of Business uh, and went into uh, the restaurant business, worked for Keg Restaurants in Vancouver, and then I was a hotel restaurant consultant with Laventhal and Horwath in Toronto. I then went on to get my master's in business uh, from Harvard Business School and, and did quite well, got the top award they give out there called a George Baker Scholar. Uh, and it was a life-changing experience to be at Harvard competing with and talking with and, and collaborating with some of the smartest people from around the world. Um, uh, at Western, it was great, but the people were primarily from around Canada. At Harvard, I was uh, competing for marks and airtime and, uh, and collaborating with and, and networking with and getting to know uh, top students from the United States, uh, Canada, and around the world. And it really was a life-changing opportunity. I got recruited by the Walt Disney Company and spent uh, a couple of years in Los Angeles uh, and, uh, and went there a lot of time in Florida and in France working on amusement parks and hotel strategy studies and, uh, and film acquisitions and TV acquisitions. And it was an incredible experience. And I worked uh, for a guy that worked uh, for uh, Gary Wilson, the CFO, and, uh, and also for a guy that worked for Michael Eisner, the uh, CEO. It was an incredible opportunity to meet with and interact with some top uh, people. I then came back to Toronto and worked for Molson's companies uh, for uh, seven years and uh, a whole success of a uh, number of jobs in the finance and planning and corporate development department, ending up being the senior vice president of corporate finance um, and assistant to, and, and, and uh, uh, treasurer and uh, investor relations. Um, I was responsible for overseeing the financial aspects of the construction of the Bell Center, Molson Center in Montreal. It was incredible. Um, um, building of uh, Aikenhead's home improvement warehouses across Canada, selling it to Home Depot, the conversion of, of uh, breweries uh, into uh, multifamily residential condominiums. Um, selling a couple of businesses, buying a couple of businesses, uh, et cetera. I then went to Vancouver and worked for Jim Pattison, the most impressive person I've ever had the privilege of working for. Um, Jim Pattison uh, group is uh, about $10 million owned by one guy. Uh, we were involved in uh, everything from uh, uh, fishing canneries all up and down the West Coast of North America uh, to uh, Ripley's, believe it or not, aquariums and, and, uh, and other amusement facilities. Um, I had an incredible time doing acquisitions and financings for him. I then moved back to Toronto and joined BioVille, a big pharmaceutical company, as the chief financial officer and spent uh, uh, seven years there working with um, an incredible gentleman, Eugene Melnick. Uh, one of the issues that you might hear uh, about me is that we had some regulatory issues. I got to tell you that while the Ontario Securities Commission and the Securities Exchange Commission uh, thought that we did wrong, um, and I actually ended up settling with them, um, not admitting that I ever did anything wrong other than saying I could have taken greater care, in preparing the, uh, the a press release. Eugene Melnick uh, was also uh, accused um, and he fought it. And uh, in the end, the Ontario Securities Commission found that any mistakes we made never broke a securities law and were immaterial. So they were exactly what we talked about, honest mistakes. Uh, so people will make a big do out of that. Uh, and it was a terrible part uh, of my corporate career, but it taught me to be a far better executive, a far better manager, be far more careful in everything I say and do um, because people, can attack you and uh, and check it out in great detail. Uh, I then uh, launched uh, my own company, Crombie Capital Partners, and I consulted for a whole raft of really interesting companies. I was hired by a private equity group to go to, uh, to the Ukraine. Um, over the course of 18 months, I spent about six months in Ukraine looking at pharmaceutical uh, and, uh, and cosmetic uh, acquisitions. Um, I, uh, I, I ended up being hired to, uh, by Eugene Malik to buy a cosmetics company, uh, Fusion Beauty, um, and, uh, and uh, and clean beauty. Uh, I got uh, a job uh, to be CFO of a botanical pharmaceutical company in Montreal called Pure Genesis. Uh, I uh, worked as the CFO for an entertainment company in Niagara Falls uh, that was bringing a uh, trying to bring a Thomas the Tank Train engine 
uh, attraction to, uh, to, to here. I worked for two different alternative energy companies, one in the ammonia space and one in the, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the uh, alternative energy where we would take manure and, uh, and other byproducts uh, from farms and convert it into uh, natural gas. Um, I had an incredibly interesting time doing a whole bunch of different jobs. And then uh, I got a job uh, as CFO for the Ottawa Centers NHL hockey team um, because they were going through some financial challenges. Uh, and during that time, I also did a big real estate development in Florida and, uh, and helped uh, the owner, Eugene Melnick, launch a medical device company, Neuroline Technologies. Uh, and I'm currently the chief operating officer for a real estate development company with assets across uh, North America. So I've had a, a really interesting career. And I've learned what it is to, to be an entrepreneur, to run a big business, to run a medium-sized business, to run a small business, to take something public, uh, the challenges of getting financing, the challenges of employing people and making sure that you can uh, meet payroll. Um, I've learned a lot in that, uh, um, in that career. I've also been very involved in charitable works. I uh, was asked by the former mayor of Mississauga, Hazel McCallion, to co-found and co-chair the Mississauga City Summit, which was a copy of the Toronto City Summit uh, back in uh, 2007. And I co-chaired that uh, for seven years. It was an incredible experience. And we had numerous different um, task forces that looked at uh, post-secondary education, housing, transit, a whole uh, a grouping of different issues uh, that then morphed into something called the GTA Summit um, that uh, had over a thousand people uh, come and, uh, and talk for a full day uh, about uh, what was wrong with uh, the Western GTA. And we attracted uh, uh, six different cities, uh, mayors, uh, uh, et cetera, to be involved. I was then uh, asked to join the board of the Mississauga Arts Council and became vice president of that and then ultimately president of that. Um, and uh, again, it was a really great experience to, to learn a lot about the artistic community in Mississauga and what was going on. <clears throat> and, uh, and then uh, um, for about the last 10 years, I've been chair of a transit advocacy organization in Toronto called uh, Transit Alliance. Um, that uh, really has, uh, has been an organization really trying to spur transit uh, interest, and investment, uh, et cetera. Um, we've had a little bit of a setback during COVID-19 because uh, the lack of the opportunity to have real in-life meetings like lots of you have, but uh, we had uh, lots of virtual meetings, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, been a great experience. And I've been through that whole time period uh, very involved in politics. I've been president of riding associations in Toronto, in West Vancouver, in Mississauga, I've been involved uh, both municipally, provincially, and uh, federally, um, and I've learned, you know, at the front line, what's good and what's bad about uh, about our political system and about our, our party system. I've always wanted to run for politics uh, because I thought I had uh, something to say. And, you know, again, lots of people will say running for the none of the above party, I've got no chance of winning, um, but I've got a good chance for making my arguments heard. And um, and who knows, we'll see if, uh, if some people decide that I'm... Uh, qualified to be the representative. I'd like to talk real quickly about uh, five issues that I think are important. And there's gonna be an opportunity to do this campaign to talk about a lot more, but I think five stand out. Number one is uh, financial sustainability. I really worry that our political system has gone to the extreme right, to the extreme left, uh, where um, we either worry about balanced budgets, we say, which I don't think are critically important. I think balancing um, uh, debt as a percentage of GDP or provincial GDP over the business cycle is critical, but balanced budgets aren't. Um, companies always have debt. Um, governments have and will always have debt. Um, and, uh, and, and the only problem is if debt is growing as a percentage of uh, GDP. But then on the left, um, we end up having debts that seem to grow forever and uh, exponentially. And as I said uh, earlier, I interviewed a chief economist of a, a fiscal watchdog organization who said, <clears throat> if the federal government institutes some of the things that they're saying they're going to institute, we're going to have a fiscally unsustainable debt position in Canada, which is ironic that he wasn't calling it out because he said people would be smart enough to not institute childcare and uh, I mean, uh, daycare and pharma care. He's not believing that the government's going to do what they're saying they're doing, which is, which is astounding to me. So I think fiscal sustainability is key, but it's challenged by a couple of things. And, and this bill 124 that you've probably have heard about, uh, which was passed by the Ontario uh, conservative government uh, to try to put a, a cap on wage increases and transfers um, uh, to uh, different organizations that, uh, that get money from the provincial government capped at 1%. May have made sense, probably didn't in an era of 2% inflation, but it clearly doesn't make sense in an era of 5 and 6% inflation. And what it means is that our nurses and, and emergency workers and a lot of other people are losing money, losing real wage money, and that's wrong. And I think that's got to change. So I think that we need to have people in the center, 
you know, what I would have called red Tories or, 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 um, or progressive conservatives, um, fiscal conservatives, or, you know, the people that were sort of the Paul Martin, uh, John Turner liberals that were worried about fiscal sustainability, because that I think is key um, that we, we've got to have. The second thing I want to talk about is affordability of housing. And it is, it is been a huge problem, probably uh, exasperated by low interest rates over the course of the last couple of years because of the central bank policies. But I think it's primarily because of municipal governments that don't approve housing, whether it's um, single family dwellings uh, or, uh, or, or bigger housing, uh, nearly as quickly as they should. And the regulatory requirements and, uh, and, and review in the, in the development business are more than we'd accept in almost any other sector of society. You know, you'll have people come in and comment about the architectural plans and, and, the, and the shading and, the, and, the, and the, the materials used on the outside and, and everything um, and that we would just not have in any other business, in my experience, other than maybe the pharmaceutical business, where they would have justifiably uh, government regulators have great concern on the safety and efficacy of products. Um, we had uh, a uh, affordability task force in Ontario that came out with uh, 55 recommendations. I think only a dozen or less than a dozen were actually instituted in the recent bill. Uh, and I think there's some things that need to change as at right zoning, where you know that you can do things no matter what, and you don't have to go through a whole process uh, is key. And what that as at right zoning is, uh, uh, is I'm open to a uh, discussion of, but there should be a reasonable amount of, of zoning that's applied across our urban and suburban areas that allow people to build what they want uh, as it right zoning. And I, I thought this, uh, this one proposal that said that single family dwellings could be increased to four units was brave and interesting. I'm not sure about four units, maybe it's less than four units, but um, you know, to give people the right to build something such that the mother-in-law or the granny suite can be built or the basement apartment can be legally built um, or that uh, you can take a big uh, house and turn it into uh, a duplex those are things that make sense and will dramatically uh, assist our, our housing affordability. The missing middle, we do a really good job at build, building big homes in the suburbs and big condos downtown, but, but the missing middle is, is what we do a terrible job of because our zoning just doesn't allow it. I think the official plans that uh, the cities have uh, aren't consistent with the places to grow legislation or other legislation that we have that say that we need densification on major arterial roads and around transit nodes. Uh, I think we need to build transit such that we can build um, greater greater density and greater height. Um, you know, around the Port Credit Go Train Station, the Clarkson Go Train Station, there should be height just like there is at uh, at Young and Shepherd or Young and Eglinton or um, uh, uh, other areas. And you know, you take a look at Young Street, half a block off of Young Street, you got single family homes. And so people that think that this uh, increased density around transit nodes is going to impact the whole uh, city are wrong. It's not. It's going to impact major arterials. We, we've got to build transit uh, lines such that it makes sense. The university line that goes up the middle of, uh, of um, the Allen, uh, Allen Road um, obviously was done for cost reasons um, to keep the cost down, but it didn't allow the, vis the, the height around it uh, and such that we're getting lots of proposals. I think there's 60 of them uh, along Dufferin, which is one major intersection away. Um, and that shows that you know people want that height. They want the height close to transit, but we didn't do it right. And the proof of it is what's happening at the Vaughan um, Metro Center, where you've got incredible height and density at the end of a long subway line. So I think we've got to be thinking about that. Um, from a transportation standpoint, um, I'm not sure about Highway 413. Um, I think that we may need another highway at some point in time in the future, but I don't think we should be thinking about it until we've actually built uh, the transit that we've been promising, which is all day two way frequent go train service on all the major lines and some lines that we haven't built on. There is a line that goes up uh, to uh, Caledon, uh, Bolton, et cetera, that people have talked about potentially uh, being a, a go train line in the future. And we haven't uh, exploited that. And you ain't, might not need 413 uh, in Caledon if you actually had really good go train service. So there, uh, I was down in Dallas recently and they're building a uh, go train like line right across uh, the Northern uh, part of the city from the airport to the suburbs in the East, very similar to building a line like, you know, across the 401. Uh, from uh, Pearson to uh, Scarborough Town Center. Uh, and we actually have a railway line, not at 401, regrettably, but uh, just north of that, um, near the 407, uh, actually south of the 407, that goes all the way across Toronto. Why isn't that a, a GO train line? And before we build that kind of line, and we have on the Mississauga Malton line, all day two way frequent GO train service, hopefully with electric trains that go every you know 15 minutes or even seven minutes, like a subway does, I don't think we should be 
um, saying that we we need more highways. And this Highway 413 that they're planning that's going to intersect uh, Highway 401 at the 403 and, uh, sorry, not the 403, at the 407 between the Mississauga-Milton border is going to decimate the 401 going west through Milton and, and on. Um, so it's the wrong place to end it. Uh, and the Bradford bypass that uh, they're talking about to connect uh, the 404 and the 400 that's going to go through some of Canada's you know, most pristine farmland and, uh, and conservation areas. I, I wonder whether we should just be eliminating the toll on the 407 between the 404 and the 400 to see if we can solve the problem of getting connection between those two highways before we build uh, the Bradford bypass. So I think we need to look at transportation uh, highway investment, particularly as it pertains to truck transportation, but we should not be doing that until and unless we actually implement the things that we've been talking about for the last 10 years from a transit standpoint that haven't yet been done, which is electrification, all day two way frequent go train service, and some of these new lines that we've been talking about. And as we do that, we should be adding density and height along those uh, lines at the transit nodes and on major arterials. Um, I think another issue is climate change. I think it is the defining issue of our generation. I think Ontario's got a good record that we should be proud of. We've probably done, I've been told, the biggest reduction in uh, greenhouse gases in Ontario of any um, uh, state jurisdiction in all of North America because of the elimination of coal. But that was because we added nuclear. And so we should be seriously thinking about um, what we're doing from a, from a nuclear investment. I do think, um, as I've talked about on the show on numerous times, ammonia is a potential solution. Ammonia is a fuel that you can burn in an industrial combustion engine and or an electric power plant. But when it burns, because there's no carbon in it, it emits no uh, 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 carbon dioxide. Uh, um, it emits no uh, uh, carbon into the atmosphere. It emits no uh, climate change uh, gases. Uh, and you can put it in pipelines. Um, you can put it, it already is distributed around the world. Um, and we can do it at source, um, uh, convert it at source from hydrocarbons into ammonia, and it could really solve our, uh, our climate change issue, uh, along with, I think, uh, nuclear. And I think the most important thing that we can do as consumers is start demanding more electricity, and then the governments are going to have to provide for it. And I think uh, I had a guy from GM that said the most important thing that you could do um, for climate change as an individual is, is buy or order an electric car. Because when the car companies all convert to electric cars, because we demand them and the electricity is demanded, the provincial governments, the government, the, the car companies are going to have to respond and the provincial government are going to have to respond. And then the last thing I'd like to talk about is, is in the pandemic, I think the biggest crisis, tragedy, et cetera, was long-term care. And the solution that um, some parties have uh, of, uh, recommended is, is to uh, not allow for-profit long-term care. I don't think that's... Um, I think that's a, a potentially um, simplistic, uh, appealing uh, solution, but it's not the real problem. The problems in long-term care weren't on profit-oriented long-term care units versus not-for-profit. They were on ones that were more modern, had good ventilation, and, and ones that had good you know, regulations and, and good guidelines. Uh, after uh, um, SARS, we had a judicial commission that talked about long-term care and what the problems were. They came forward with a whole bunch of recommendations. Those recommendations weren't implemented by our provincial government um, uh, and what should have been. And I think we should do the same thing again. I think that one of the biggest problems that we found, um, and you know, it's been interesting as we've talked about uh, the efficacy of masks and debated vaccine mandates and things like this. One of the biggest issues, this is a lot of our institutions, long-term care in schools in Ontario have got really lousy HVAC, air conditioning, uh, heating systems, such that the air turns over three times an hour where modern facilities turn the air over six to 10 times an hour. And if it takes 15 minutes of long-term exposure to the virus to get it, if the, the HVAC system is old and dilapidated and poor, the chance of getting COVID goes up dramatically, the chance of getting a flu goes up dramatically, the chance of getting the common cold goes up dramatically. And so old ventilation systems that weren't, uh, that weren't modernized end up being a really critical problem. And if that's part of the problem and bad regulation and oversight is part of the problem. And, and, and we had really good results, um, low mortality, low infections in for-profit homes and not for-profit homes that had some of those things. The simplistic answer of saying, you know, just no for-profit homes is wrong. And some of the not-for-profits, the Victorian Order of Nurses and other organizations are struggling. So not-for-profit or charitable or provincial owned is not the solution. Good regulation and good HVAC systems and, 
and good staff that maybe not go from one uh, one place to another uh, and carrying the virus with them are the solutions. And that's exactly what the Judicial Commission uh, after SARS found out, and I think that's what we'll find out today. And so I guess my bottom line is I worry that too many of the political parties today think they're buying your votes because you don't pay attention and they'll give you dollar a beer, dollar, you know, dollar a, 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 a case beer. Uh, they'll give you a dollar um, a transit. They'll give you not for profit uh, um, uh, long term care. They'll say, I'll take the tolls away uh, on uh, on some highways. They'll say that uh, I'm not going to charge you for your license sticker renewal. It's simplistic answers to 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 some complicated issues. And I think that affordability isn't going to be impacted by those things. I think affordability is going to be impacted by making municipal governments approve projects in half or one third the time. I'm not saying approve bad projects, but there's no reason why a developer has to be thinking it's going to take, you know, five to eight years to get a project out of the ground. And that's obviously going to impact how much they can build. We're going to have the city, a population the size of the city of Montreal move to the greater Toronto area in the next 10 years. Where are we going to house them? So I think that I'd love to be part of the discussion. I've got the qualifications, I believe. I've got the issues. I have knowledge. Uh, and I'd love to, uh, to, to, to make my arguments. Thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. That's my show for tonight, the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. Uh, if I decide to run, I'm going to have to go off the air. Um, but hopefully you'll still listen to me. Thanks. Good night. By the way, you can always get information about me on my website, BrianCrombie.com. Um, all my uh, all my shows are posted there. I'm also on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and uh, YouTube, and uh, I'm on uh, Audible, Apple, and Speakeasy uh, um, podcasts. Good night, everybody. <laughs>